members, we now have quorum, so the meeting is open to the public. And as per all meetings that are currently being held, this is fully virtual today. And can I remind you all that the committee meeting will be recorded and published online. And today we've got myself, Emma Sheer in the chair, we've got Mike Nesbitt, the vice chair, we've got Michelle Michael Wien, Paula Bradshaw and Carol McCollum. So our first item on the agenda is apologies and don't have any formal apologies this afternoon. We don't yet have Christopher Stelford and Mark Durkin in the meeting, but they may join us at some time at some time later on. So the next, and I've just been made aware that Mark has joined, so welcome, Mark. Uh, the next item on our uh, car this afternoon is a briefing from the Assembly Engagement um, Team, and this is going to be an overview of the stakeholder engagements that we have had over the course of the past number of weeks. So I want to welcome Louise Coase to the meeting, and you can find the clerk's memo in relation to this on page five of your meeting papers. And can I just start at the outset by thanking Louise and the team, and of course, Carly the PERC and uh, Gavin and everyone involved in the sort of administrative side of these stakeholder events. I think we have 12 or 13 in total and I know myself, Mike, Carl, I think Paula was in some of them as well um, and they were very well attended and, and, and quite useful and very worthwhile events. So Louise, I'll pass over your, to yourself there. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yeah, I'll just quickly run through what's been happening over the last couple of months. So, as you know, as part of the committee's consultation process, um, the engagement service supported the committee to deliver a series of um, stakeholder events to gather the qualitative data to complement the, the survey that was done earlier in the year and to get a wide cross-section of um, the public, particularly from those from um, the more hard-to-reach um, groups. Um, obviously, due to COVID restrictions, um, those events had to be held virtually, so we delivered them um, over Zoom. We had 10 events that took place between the 16th of March and the 5th of May, um, which mainly focused on Section 75 groups, which included older people, religious and cultural groups, LGBTQ+, people with physical um, disabilities and their carers, um, people with um, a learning disability, uh, women, Black and Asian and uh, minority ethnic communities. And uh, yesterday evening, we had the, the final event, which was um, children and young people. It's probably the most energetic one we've had we had out of, out of the lot. Um, for those who didn't identify with any of those, um, we also held a, a demo public event as well. And um, we also had another event in partnership with Human Rights Consortium. Uh, there was also for asylum seekers and travellers, we um, did uh, talk to a number of organisations who represent those groups and um, they recommended that we would um, do them slightly differently. So those organisations sought the views of those groups um, themselves, as, as I said, that would be the most effective way to engage with them. So in total, two, over 210, uh, 216 people took part in the project. Um, I was actually hoping at this stage to mention the organisations who helped support the events. And um, whenever we did our tally last night, there was over 65. So I won't bore the committee with listing all of them, but I know that um, there'll be thank you um, letters sent to them. I would, however, like to mention a couple of organisations, um, the Red Cross, Positive Futures, MenCap and Now Project, um, because those organisations actually took the stakeholder event um, and uh, and the, the PowerPoints and, and information that we provided and, and tailored it to specific their specific audience. So that the Red Cross delivered the stakeholder events in uh, different languages to different groups and um, Positive Futures in particular took the, the presentations and um, converted them so that they would be um, easily understand, uh, understood by people with learning disabilities. And um, we had the three organisations, Positive Futures, Men, Cap and Now Project, facilitated um, a group with, with 25 um, people. That was a, an excellent event. Um, so just some background for those members who, who couldn't attend um, the stakeholder events. The, how they worked is the committee clerk provided some background um, on the establishment of the committee and its work to date and a bit of background on the um, a Bill of Rights, uh, just to make sure people understood what it, what it was they were being asked. Um, participants were then invited to work in smaller groups and breakout rooms and they were discuss um, three key questions. So the questions were, how important, if at all, do you think a Bill of Rights is for Northern Ireland and why? 
Uh, what are your views on including a preamble or introduction for a Bill of Rights, um, setting out a vision or ideas for society here? And then the third question was, um, what rights, of any, um, would you like to see protected in a Bill of Rights? Um, they were then provided the opportunity to feedback their views on the three main questions to the group. And I know um, the chairperson and members of the committee were in attendance in um, all of those um, sessions, which was great. And uh, that was really appreciated by the, the attendees as well, too. Um, all of the stakeholder events were recorded for the purposes of note taking in, in the breakout rooms and um, a summary of the sessions has been provided in the paper in your pack today. Um, all the feedback sessions, um, as I said, have been recorded and we will, we hopefully will be loading them onto the assembly website, both in video and in audio form. Um, so if you did miss uh, any of the sessions, you can catch the feedback sessions um, next week. Um, so just a quick synopsis of uh, some of the, the feedback um, under each of those questions. So under question one, how important, if at all, was it, uh, uh, do you think a Bill of Rights is for Northern Ireland and why? There was an overwhelming majority that felt um, Bill of Rights was very important and um, also long overdue. Um, this was in keeping with the results that were in the survey and um, many of the participants felt that Bill of Rights would, be, would be, provide important rights and protections for um, minority groups and, and those who are vulnerable. Um, many of them were very eager that a Bill of Rights should uh, to be actionable and, and forward thinking and also in an accessible format. Again, that came out um, both in the, the disability uh, groups and in the the um, we were talking about you know, multilingual um, issues in formats as well too, and that a programme of education would be um, critical in making a Bill of Rights user-friendly. Um, another common theme was a Bill of Rights um, should be centred around equality. Um, many of the groups highlight the diverse, the diverse nature of Northern Ireland in the 21st century, and that move away from an orange and green society to a, a very diverse society, and that a Bill of Rights should reflect that. Uh, moving on to question two, what are your views on including a preamble or introduction for a Bill of Rights um, and setting a, a vision or ideas for society here? There, again, there was a broad agreement from all groups that a preamble and setting out a vision and values for Northern Ireland was valuable. Um, the majority of groups discussed whether a preamble should be inspirational, inspirational or actionable. Um, and... Uh, there was concerns um, uh, that a balance had to be struck between this and, and many also wanted preamble to be easy to interpret. Um, and I, I think that came across uh, across all of the, the um, sessions, but was that um, things need to, people need to identify with it and be able to understand understand it as well. Um, many of the values um, were raised by the groups um, included equality, dignity, respect, fairness um, and opportunity being the most commonly um, discussed. Other values included compassion, inclusion and strength and diversity. And uh, I think if you reflect back to the survey that uh, was conducted and the results there, it was very reflective of um, the survey results. So the third and final um, question, what rights, of any, um, would you like to see protected in the Bill of Rights? Um, there was a wide ranging discussion within each group, and this is where you were maybe getting the nuance between the different Section 75 groups. Um, uh, as expected, each group was primarily concerned with the rights that impacted their own sector of community. But um, it was surprising as well, too, that actually all the groups were looking uh, more cross-cutting than that uh, as well. And many groups raised the issue of um, intersectional, intersectionality as well, too, um, and the fact that the, the rights are cross-cutting. Um, most commonly discussed rights were around disability, again, which reflected the, the survey, access to health care, mental health, education, housing, social security, language, equality, and freedom from discrimination. Um, one other issue that was raised consistently was the impact of COVID-19 on the pandemic on people's human rights. So that was a theme that ran through all of the sessions. Um, the report you have goes uh, into detail on the responses from each individual group. Um, but I wanted to highlight one particular, which I mentioned we only had um, the Young Pe Persons event last night. Um, and uh, I think uh, everybody who was there last night would agree that we couldn't have found a more passionate and articulate group. 
um, I would imagine we might see some of those young people in the assembly in the future. Um, we used an online tool um, to take some of their responses and um, I'm just going to try and share the screen here. Hopefully you'll be able to and maybe just ask um, the clerk if that, yes, you can see that okay. Um, so this just gives you a bit of a flavour of how um, they answered the the same questions through these, these post-it notes. So you can see, again, very reflective of the feedback that we had from, from the other groups as well too. See if I can move this, oh, see if I can move this down. Again, this is just um, some of the thoughts they had on, on the values, equality, inclusion, respect, um, Bill of Rights giving you more protection. Um, everyone is equal and the laws are there. Some people felt as well too. So, And then the final one there, um, what rights, if any, would you like to see protected in a Bill of Rights? So I know um, that the clerking team will provide um, the um, images that we have from the feedback in the final report as well too. Um, but uh, I think, as I said, like all all the groups, they felt very strongly that they would like to see an outcome from this process. They mentioned the incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, and many of them highlighted this already being done in Scotland and, and why not here. Um, and uh, I, I, But I think that was the, the main themes from, from that event last night. Um, and just before I, I go, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank members on behalf of the Engagement Communications team. Um, because there was a lot of innovative approaches that we proposed the committee and I I'm, I'm, was very pleased that you, you were supportive of those. Um, and uh, the feedback that we have got from stakeholders has been extremely positive across the board, um, especially going through the, this process of the, the stakeholder events. And um, just finally, I wanted we had a, a feedback from Sinead McSorley in the Children's Law Centre last night um, and she just wanted to thank the committee um, for the opportunity and just what she said, I was hugely impressed by the rich discussion on behalf of the uh, coordinators and young people. I know our youth advocates agree this is one of the most meaningful consultations they've taken part in recently. So I think that, that says it all um, about giving the young people and, and the others to have their opportunity heard on this issue. So um, that's, uh, that's my uh, feedback report on the stakeholder events. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, I suppose I don't really have many questions as such for you, and I'll open it up to other members here. I think because I had taken part in so many of the feedback sessions and you could see the same themes emerging sort of time after time around, you know, inclusivity and ensuring that these rights would be made available to everyone, the importance of accessibility. Um, there was there were there were broad themes which were popping up again and again. And I suppose it was really heartening to hear, you know, people from across society from different backgrounds getting so involved and, you know, taking ownership of this process. Now there were a few um, of the sessions where we were asked about the timeline and the real, like the realistic um, sort of process here, or the, I suppose, the, the likelihood of this um, process concluding with the Bill of Rights. And I know that some people had said that they almost felt like they had been doing this ad nauseum for years um, at this stage. And that obviously would be a concern that I would share myself. But I, I generally find, found them to be very, very good sessions. and. I have to say, very well done to yourselves and they were well handled and well managed. I don't know if anyone else is looking in at this stage. No, no one. Okay, well, Louise, you can take your ease then. <laughs> Thank you. Your face is too much there, so thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day. Good woman. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Are you bringing Anne Marie into the spotlight? Okay. Oh, hi, so, hmm. members, next we have a briefing from Anne Marie Fleming, who um, was sort of taking the lead on the engagement with young people through the schools um, process. So, Amory, if you want to give us an overview. Thanks very much, uh, Chairperson. <clears throat> Thanks very much, everyone.
everybody. Um, as many of the panel uh, join us um, on sessions with schools and have done in the past, um, I'm sure you're aware that normally we do um, kind of work on explaining the assembly, but we were approached uh, by the committee clerk uh, to assist the committee in its work and carry out uh, focus groups with a number of schools. And we were delighted to do so. And at this point, I want to pay um, since real tribute to to the schools for uh, making the time, we approached schools uh, in October, and all bar none said that yes, they would be um, delighted to take part. We chose the range of schools from uh, across the sectors, uh, including uh, integrated Irish medium and special, and um, schools uh, opted to um, do the focus groups in in January. And as you know, we hit another lockdown in January. And um, that had a knock on effect of delaying the focus groups. So they were mainly um, happened in, in March uh, and April. And we had 14 in total. And then we had uh, one group not in a traditional um, educational setting. So while I pay tribute to the teachers, I also have to say um, all bar none of the young people who took part uh, were superb. Um, the committee clerk provided us with um, background information on the work of the committee and the topic, and uh, this was passed on to the schools. We didn't make um, doing any research compulsory because we have an appreciation as to how busy uh, teachers and young people are, uh, in particular this year given the high level of disruption. Um, but we do know from conversation um, that the students went off and did their own research and they all came to the focus groups um, very focused and um, very intent on sharing their view in a very open and honest and animated way, uh, as you can imagine. So um, the focus group... Um, the questions related to uh, those that were mainly covered in the survey. And although we had um, 14 schools from across Northern Ireland and one group not in a traditional educational setting, we did let all schools know uh, about uh, the survey while it was live. And we know that a number of schools contributed their views uh, using um, that method. So um, I know, I'm aware that you have the report in front of you, so I'll only pick out um, the, the salient points. And um, listening to my colleague Louise Close in the last session, there were a lot of uh, common themes that came out. But what's amazing is, for me, um, is that we were dealing with um, P6 right up to 17 and 18. So um, very young um people right up to, to young adults and all mentioning kind of the, the same area. So in relation to the first one, as to what extent the young people felt that everybody was treated equally in the same way, um, there was agreement across the board that they felt that there were groups that were unfairly treated. And um, there was a lot of discussion around LGBTQ groups, um, black and ethnic minorities, people with disability, um, people from poorer backgrounds and, and older people. Um, there was a, a lot of conversation given the year that we had as to how um, difficult a lot of grandparents found the last year in terms of the technology and communication. Um, given that these were students, I'm sure that you won't be surprised that they mentioned that they felt there was inequality around education and um, academic selection and um, how some people were accessing tutoring and other people didn't have the method uh, to do so. Um, the area of um, people with disabilities came up as well. And there was a lot of discussion about how those with disabilities have to often um, travel long distances to get services uh, and education. In terms of what groups um, the focus groups felt needed added protections, it really mirrored the groups that they mentioned in terms of uh, inequality and those that they felt weren't getting uh, equal treatment. Uh, it was interesting that um, one co-ed group um, who I engaged with and focused and who participated in a focus group um, they mentioned women and um, how they felt there was a lot of inequality around women. But the males in that group um, also mentioned how there were a lot of uh, men that featured um, in, in the suicide rates and there, there was an agreement that there were mental health issues uh, across the board in Northern Ireland. Um, a lot of groups mentioned at all ages uh, of known of, of 
of incidences of racism and homophobia and, and how this was the problem uh, that they hoped uh, would be addressed uh, in some way. Um, there was a question that we asked about how um, young people felt Northern Ireland is different to other places and what might that mean in terms of protections. And this was a very interesting question because all bar none uh, mentioned the past using their own former words. So they talked about um, issues with the past. Some mentioned the word the troubles, some mentioned the word the conflict, and some mentioned the word the fi fighting. And how that the Northern Ireland they're living in today um, has, is, has links to this and also um, the whole area of segregation or the word separate was used. So uh, separate schools, um, segregated housing, things like that. And uh, they mentioned poor mental health, uh, about how they felt um, there were there was instances of poor mental health here, maybe more so than there were in other parts. And there was a discussion in one group, actually, in relation to us being separate and, and separate communities and, and how that was mirrored in our political structures with a first minister and a deputy first minister representing um, two different communities. And when that was discussed, that, that was welcomed and th th they saw that as being a good thing. Um, only one group, when they were given this question, their instinct was to say um, Northern Ireland is different because we have more fun and banter here. So it, it was nice to hear mention of that as well. And I want to uh, highlight that too. Um, in terms of values, um, we asked uh, in our focus groups, um, what values um, the young people um, would like to see, and they was the great evidence or, of peace being mentioned quite a lot, nearly in all the focus groups. And again, that probably goes back uh, to the last question, where there's great awareness of uh, the past. Um, there was a, an interesting discussion about. Um, acceptance and um, how one person felt that we nearly need to move beyond tolerance. The tolerance was just accepting and that there should be a greater and a more warmth towards um, difference and equality for everyone. And a lot of these young people now, of course, are, are studying democracy and what democracy is. So um, there was a lot of support for freedom of expression. Um, moving on to their views on a Bill of Rights, um, yes, across the board, um, a Bill of Rights got great support. However, there were concerns mentioned in a few of the uh, older groups that this might lead to um, a cause for arguments uh, among politicians in particular, and they were nervous uh, of that. In terms of what they'd like to see in a Bill of Rights, um, the pandemic that we're living through, of course, has brought the NHS and healthcare into sharp focus. So that was mentioned. And indeed, there were concerns about the long waiting lists and um, private healthcare and how private healthcare would um, pose problems for people on low incomes. Um, the right to housing, the right to good food. Um, one boy mentioned about how you know, it shouldn't really be left to Marcus Rashford um, and celebrities to, to raise the profile of, of, of free school meals and um, getting food for young people. Uh, protecting the environment. Um, young people, I think, are very environmentally aware and um, have a lovely quote included in the report where um, one student talked about um, putting up a, a bird table during lockdown and how they appreciate uh, the birds and the wildlife that are now visiting their garden and they're getting great joy out of that. Um, freedom for cultural, religious expression and, of course, uh, protection for uh, uh, minority groups and the LGBT community come out very strongly. So, again, I'd like to put on record my thanks in particular to the young people uh, and the group leaders and the teachers who went out of their way. Um, we were delighted to arrange the focus groups, but it was made um, so easy by the enthusiasm showed uh, by the schools on the other side who were so keen uh, to, get in part, to get on board with the committee's uh, research. So happy to take questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie, for that um, report. And I should have said to members that the results of the findings can be found in your table papers pack. But I suppose um, what I, and you've touched on it there, 
even when you're outlining the key themes, what I found really sort of interesting and and I suppose reflective of the broader feedback that we've had from both the feedback from both the stakeholders groups and the consultation responses in that they identified LGBTQ plus BAME people, disabled people as being the, the groups that most need rights protections. And I suppose it just drills at home for us that, you know, we can think about this in a very abstract way. But there you have means who can identify that this is about real life and it's about our own real lives and they're able to sort of and all of those examples that we've given around, you know, the the holiday hunger and the access to help with, you know, children or whatever for the for the transfer mm-hmm. test. And those inequalities that present themselves in mm-hmm. different towns, villages and rural areas across the north that you wouldn't, you know, that you wouldn't really think of in terms of rates, but we can see how the implementation of Bill of Rights might have real life um, implications for people. So um, I don't know if any other member is looking to come in at this point. Don't see anyone indicating. So, Amory, look, I just want to thank you again for that piece of work. And I noticed you got to two schools in Mid Ulster, so fair play. It wasn't just a Belfast-centric uh, mission, yeah. uh, which I think is always important and good that we're getting the rural voice. So, um, no, I, I appreciate uh, the work there. And that's a, a really interesting report and, and good to see that our young people are in support of a Bill of Rights and support of equality for everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay. So, members, our next presentation is from the churches. So, I'll give people a minute to be brought up into the spotlight. Members, you'll be aware that this briefing was originally scheduled um, for the 15th of April, but it had to be postponed that day at very late notice because of uh, an ad hoc committee on, on the COVID response. And we had obviously changes announced that day in terms of the, the lifting of restrictions. So I just want to reiterate at this point our thanks to the, the guys for being so cooperative and changing their, their plans last minute and agreeing to come in for this session this afternoon. So um, we've got the very Reverend Timothy Bartlett from um, St Mary's Catholic Church in Belfast. We've got Reverend David Clements, the Minister of Kalabaki Medis. Med- Methodist Church, apologies. Uh, the very Reverend Shane Forster, who's the Dean of Armagh Cathedral, Church of Ireland. Reverend Trevor Gribbon, Clerk of the General Assembly at the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Ms. Karen Jardine, who's a Public Affairs Officer for the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. And Mrs. Danielle McElhenney, who's Public Policy Officer for the Evangelical Alliance. And you can find uh, the Clerk's Memo from page 28 if you're meeting papers. And then you've got a joint submission and then different submission from the different church groups. So I want to welcome you all to this afternoon's meeting and I'm not sure who's going to begin the briefing, but jump in and we can go from there. Chair, sure. if I was able to begin, if I can be heard okay, yeah. Good. Thank you. My name is Trevor Gribben. I'm the General Secretary of the, the, the Presbyterian Church. And thank you uh, for facilitating uh, this briefing uh, and the committee for inviting us along and, and the clerk and others for facilitating that. We were particularly delighted about the easing of restrictions in the day we had a council, so it was no, no hardship uh, for probably for the whole of our community. Uh, the, the reason we've come as a, an interchurch group is because as Christian and Christian leaders, we share a huge amount in common, though every church will have slightly different emphasis, probably as every individual does. And so today we, we, we represent, as you've said, Chairman, Chair, uh, the, the, the Presbyterian Church, Methodist Church, Church of Ireland, Catholic Church, and the Evangelical Alliance representing a, a, a number of other churches and individual organizations. Uh, Sometimes there's the impression, in the media at least, that the churches and Christians generally are against human rights. Uh, And that impression is sometimes given by by some of the journalism and some of the media of the way they present every issue as a confrontational issue. And because what makes the news is often what some might see as areas of controversy with regard to rights, Sometimes the impression is that churches and people 
of other persuasions are against human rights. Nothing uh, could be further from the truth. We engage on a regular basis with the Human Rights Commission, for instance, and, and in what the Human Rights Commission do, 90% of that would be shared by, by Christian churches, Christian leaders, and, and indeed most of our society. We place a huge value on human rights. And the, the Christian perspective in human rights, I suppose, brings together three key thoughts, that we have a shared humanity and therefore a shared dignity, uh, that we've got shared responsibility, and we have rights that go alongside that in the context of relationships. Uh, and one of my colleagues will, will unpack that in a little bit, in a, little, a few moments with, with your permission. But those, those three aspects go together at the very core, a shared humanity and dignity, shared responsibility and relationships. Uh, and I was really, really glad in, in the two presentations we were able to listen into there from Louise and Anna, Anna Marie, that young people were bringing out the, the truth that rights has to work out in the context of relationships. It's ultimately not an abstract thing. It's about how we relate in this community and watching out uh, for those who are in minorities. Uh, the churches sometimes have difference, different nuances in, in particular aspects of human rights, as you would, would expect. But together, we would share those three core uh, principles. I'm going with, with your permission, Chair, to ask two of my colleagues to come in at this stage to unpack slightly more in this opening presentation, and then we'll, of course, be open for questions. And if I could hand over, uh, with permission, to, to Karen Jardine at, at this point. Um, thank you, Trevor. And um, oh, can you see me again? Yep. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. I'm um, sorry, thank you. And um, thank you to the chair and committee members for this opportunity. Um, I think the, the briefings that you've had just before us um, probably only give a slight picture or window into the huge amount of work that you've all been engaged with um, over the past period of time. And um, we just want to say thank you for doing, doing that work and that we don't envy your task really in pulling it all together to try and find that um, way forward as you report back um, to the Assembly. I suppose um, much of the evidence that, that you've received as a committee has focused on what we might call the pursuit of the common good. And I think for everyone, the ultimate goal is how can we build a society in which everyone can flourish? And as Trevor has mentioned, those three um, core principles that rights can't be divorced from our relationships, one from another, and our responsibilities within those relationships. And if I could use a picture, um, it's a bit like a three-legged stool and each strand can only really, um, is, it's not only essential, each strand is essential, but they all must remain in balance with each other um, as well. And society um, places an increasingly high value on rights. And in some cases they're now seen as the ultimate protectors of freedom and happiness. But I suppose just one question would be, is that the only lens or instrument by which we would assess what is a benefit to the flourishing of all in society? And just to reflect something that came out, um, as Anne-Marie reflected on what some young people in schools had said, but just that sense of a lengthy list of rights enshrined in legislation might have the potential of creating a perverse effect, um, creating competition between individuals and groups rather than um, promoting good community relations. It might instead promote a focus on litigation rather than reconciliation, um, focusing on the common good. I just wanted to say that when we talk about rights, responsibilities and relationships, we're not saying that those, for example, without mental capacity or below a recognised legal age of responsibility don't have access to rights or should be less able to realise those rights. Um, rather, what we're saying is that those who are in a position to determine what might be included in a Bill of Rights should be thinking about this balance and context. And I think the conversation that the committee is having about values is particularly important in this respect and reminds us that our relationships with each other and responsibility to one another must be an integral part of the consideration. I think um, the committee has heard from other witnesses about the concept, concept of Ubuntu and probably that aptly sums up when, what we're talking about, about that interconnection 
between rights and responsibilities and relationships. So, Chair, before um, I hand over to um, Tim Bartlett, I just want to make a further remark um, reflecting on some of the evidence which the committee has heard. And there's been some suggestions that the best way to approach this is to simply transpose international human rights treaties into our own domestic law. And just at this stage, I would suggest that this approach would be a very blunt instrument, um, which wouldn't really in any way acknowledge particular circumstances in Northern Ireland um, or take account of existing legislative provisions or allow for really any consideration of these complex issues by our democratically elected representatives that um, as you're undertaking in your role um, today. So if I hand over to, um, to Tim and he'll just conclude this part of the presentation. Uh, Chair, is Tim there? Tim can hear us. I don't have anyone on my side now. I can hear um, all of you and see all of you. Can you hear me? No. We can hear you. Yeah. Yes, and we can see you now oh, too. Yeah, I am right, okay. <laughs> can you see me now, yeah? Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, can I thank all of you for the opportunity to make this submission or presentation? Um, and to affirm everything that my colleagues Trevor and Karen have said. Um, I had the great privilege of representing the churches uh, with others on the Bill of Rights Forum that you'll be very familiar with back in 2006 to 2008, chaired by Chris Sidoti. And I, I know you're aware of all of that work and will, have, will be harvesting some of that. And just to say that I, at that time, we made great progress, I thought, um, and it's worth going back to some of the issues raised there. But the churches collectively, um, as others have said there, share this common set of values that are rooted in human dignity, uh, concern for the common good, and co-responsibility. But one of the more technical issues that arose back then that I think is key to how you're going to move forward, and that was raised by the churches at the time, was the origins of this desire for a Bill of Rights was, of course, the Good Friday Agreement. Not the only source of the request for it, but it was a key part of that. And in, in a sense, it's part of the unfinished work of that. And the Good Friday Agreement, rather controversially, uh, as we look at it now, framed any such Bill of Rights in terms of addressing the particular situation of Northern Ireland. And the Bill of Rights Forum back in 2006 to 2008 really got bogged down in that issue to some extent. What does that mean? Now, I haven't heard anybody mention that qualification of the Good Friday Agreement in either the presentations we heard just before we, we started our own uh, or in the, the subsequent discussions. But I just wonder where that is in terms of the idea of a Bill of Rights, because one of the big concerns that was shared was where is the limit on the issue of rights being justiciable and enshrined in a bill and the role, particularly in the case of the Northern Ireland Assembly and devolution of a local devolved uh, democratically elected legislature. Uh, you know, what issues belong there? What issues belong in a bill of rights? And one of the concerns that arose was that everybody with a particular and very often very important and valid social, political, economic agenda and issue would try to see that manifested or concluded or resolved through a Bill of Rights. So I think a huge issue there is what are the opportunities, the benefits, but also the limitations of a Bill of Rights. And another big theme that Karen has touched on there that came from the faith sector was a concern that, um, you know, that the, the language of rights is fundamental, it's important, supported by Christian anthropology. Indeed, it has its origins in the Christian anthropology in Europe. Um, but as we progress in our understanding of human rights, part of the new language of human rights is, as Karen said, this other issue of social responsibility. And to take our own context uh, in that regard, one of the threads that emerged from that was, okay, well, rights can be about um, what I am entitled to, 
But what is my responsibility, say in the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland, to contribute, to work for as a citizen, uh, a peaceful, reconciled and shared society? So it's maybe one of the big appeals the faith communities would want to make is how you try to develop and progress, even in international human rights terms, the, the philosophy of a Bill of Rights, as well as the content, um, and that you would not be limited just to seeing the important claims that a bill would provide to citizens, but also, if you like, the challenge to citizens and institutions of government and all of the sectors to contribute positively to a wider common good, uh, which in our particular circumstances of Northern Ireland would include things like contributing to a peaceful, reconciled, shared Northern Ireland. So if I may just say that the Catholic Church and the Catholic bishops have constantly, consistently supported the idea of a Bill of Rights as proposed by the Good Friday Agreement. And I will say that the churches uh, shared in their submissions a particular concern about social and eco economic rights and some of the legacy of conflict in uh, still there in our society, particularly child poverty and the exceptionally high levels of child poverty we have on these islands in this region. <clears throat> and one particular issue that I was very passionate about. Um, but I hope you've been you're, you're, you're satisfied that the basic posture from our faith commitment and vision and values is to support the concept of a Bill of Rights, the questions of just disability, what you incorporate, what you don't, these are yours to decide. Um, but we did signal a concern that there has to be an important discussion about what is the proper role of the legislature and what's the proper role of the Bill of, of a Bill of Rights and the claims that it can afford to citizens. Um, and we took a kind of maximal view of that. Um, and then also I think this critical thing would be nor an, a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland should be cutting edge, not only in its content, its claims, but also in its philosophy, including this sense of a call to social responsibility. We have a responsibility to protect, promote, develop each other's rights because of our common dignity and our inherent common future as human beings on this shared planet. I don't know how helpful that is, but um, <laughs> just to share that with you. And one of, one of, I'll just conclude with this. One of the problems that the Bill of Rights Forum got into was that the effort to overreach uh, in terms of trying to get everything into a Bill of Rights in the end tripped us all up, I think. And as Karen said, <clears throat> created a sense of, of competing groups, competing rights. I would strongly argue, if I may, that go for what is possible um, uh, rather than everything that might be wanted in the hope that it's an organic uh, bill um, and that, that they can grow and develop and respond to the changing circumstances of our situation. Thank you very much for your time and your patience. Sure, if it would be possible at this stage uh, just to bring in one uh, additional person and then we're happy to respond to any questions. Uh, I'm not sure if as a ad hoc committee uh, you've heard uh, any evidence from uh, formal victims or survivors groupings. Uh, obviously because of our pastoral work on the ground in every community uh, across these islands, this island in fact, uh, we, we have a big pastoral concern for people who have been victims of conflict, the survivors of conflict. And with permission, Chair, uh, Dr. David Clements, uh, who represents the Methodist Church, but also has had a long history of working with victims and survivors, might want to say something about that and how it relates to rights, particularly from our understanding a Christian perspective, if David was able to come in just to, to wind up our presentation. Uh, thank you. Um, can I be heard okay? Yeah. Um, I uh, agree entirely with what uh, uh, my colleagues have already said and um, uh, the issue of um, linking rights, responsibilities, relationships uh, is the key to what the Methodist Church um, have said on this. Um, and it's quite some time ago that we did some work on it, and I had to get a, a, a colleague on our committee who has um, since um, retired to dig out of his um, uh, 
uh, out of his uh, his loft um, some of the papers that we had written and, and the work that we'd done, um, which um, underlines uh, what I think is an important question is uh, – this has been talked about for quite some time, and uh, obviously Tim was uh, at the heart of some of the conversations back in whatever it was, 2006, 2008. Um, what have we missed a, a, in the 15 years since, uh, or go back to 20 years to, to the Good Friday Agreement, or 20 plus years, um, not having had a Northern Ireland specific Bill of Rights? Um, what, what have we missed out on? What, what groups in, in in Northern Irish society uh, have not had their um, rights fully um, recognised and their needs um, met? Um, I think that's an important question for you as a committee to to kind of ponder. Um, and it may be that uh, you uh, actually conclude that. Um, uh, given the kind of reasonably civilized um, society we have, uh, democratic um, Western society, uh, a bit of problems, um, you know, uh, the the um, progress has been made, and uh, maybe a bill of rights would add a little, but not that much um, to that. The one group of people that might answer differently. And the one group of people who might um, come to you and say, well, actually, the fact that we haven't had um, our particular rights recognized over this uh, period of time, uh, we have lost out. And arguably, um, the one groups most specifically that uh, could make that claim would be people who have suffered the most through the Troubles. Um, as uh, Trevor said, I've, I'm a Methodist minister, but I've also been involved with the Wave Trauma Center, as some of you might will know, of course, um, for 30 years or so. Um, not quite 30, ne nearly 30 years. Um, and uh, there are a lot of people, and uh, at the moment we're, we're perhaps coming to a, a crunch with regards to legacy and who knows what um, is going to be said later today or next week uh, and so on. Um, so I, I think in terms of groups that have missed out, uh, gr groups that have maybe um, not been as fairly and as generously dealt with as they might have been, um, it's arguable that uh, those who have suffered the most uh, from the troubles, both in terms of uh, missing justice, uh, losing um, uh, support. Uh, I mean, it's uh, I've got lots of um, friends in the Wave Trauma Centre who've been on the the injured campaign group and um, people in wheelchairs and stuff who 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 have, who've campaigned. Um, endlessly for, well, almost 10 years now. I was involved with them at the very beginning and not quite so involved in more recent years, but I'm still keenly interested in, in, in the injured pension uh, and the fact that that is still not yet implemented. And I know we're, we've turned a few corners and we're making progress, but that might be a, a good illustration just to explore in terms of, uh, of people's um, specific uh, rights related to the, um, the, 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 the Northern Ireland situation uh, that progress can be made. So I don't know whether that's a helpful comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I suppose these are all helpful comments. Uh, is that the conclusion of your presentation? Do you want to um, some questions? Uh, we're open to questions. If there were no questions and you want another minute or so from us, Danielle, who's with us today, uh, might want to say something particularly about disability and beginning and end of life. Uh, but we're happy to use the time for questions as well. We don't want to abuse the, you know, the time we have. No, uh, I just I had noticed Danielle was unmuted. So Danielle, fire away if you want to add something, and then I do have some questions and comments. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Great. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee, the chair, and the committee for and the members for the opportunity of giving evidence today with regards to the creation of the Bill of Rights. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Evangelical Alliance in Northern Ireland, and I don't have the years of experience that some of my fellow witnesses today have. So I very much defer to their background knowledge and their deep understanding of the complexities of the issues associated with this Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland. Uh, however, the Evangelical Alliance is the oldest and largest evangelical unity movement in the UK, and we have been working with churches in our communities um, since 1846. 
And here in Northern Ireland, we've been working for 30 years and engaging across a wide range of policy issues and meeting with a wide range of groups. And so it's this engagement that actually gives me and enables me to speak today on behalf of our members. So recently, we have been engaging um, with our members and a wider Christian audience on multiple issues, but one of them in particular is the issue of disability and the church. Um, so just within the last few weeks, we've held webinars and we've held uh, roundtable events uh, discussing disability and the church and the attitudes of society within and without the church. Um, this work uh, is largely led by my colleague Donna, who is the mother to Micah, a profoundly autistic 12-year-old boy. Donna has been advocating for disability rights, protections and services for years, most recently working with Chris Little and the Education Committee to advocate for the education, support and respite care, which was cut during COVID and continues to be a huge concern. So I think Donna would be the first... Well, Danielle, you're frozen. Is that just on my side or is everyone... No. Yeah, or frozen everybody. Yeah. Oh, unfortunate. Um, well, look, I'm, I'll jump in with some questions and comments, and then if Danielle um, gets her connection back, we can maybe see if she wants to conclude her comments then. So, um, look, I want to begin by thanking you all for, for joining us this afternoon and for your, your feedback, both in written submission and your oral evidence um, there with, with the committee. Uh, I suppose there are a number of things for me. I've been asking an awful lot of the presenters that we've had and people from legal backgrounds and people with vast experience in the creation of bills of rights elsewhere and even in the process here in the North um, around a bill of rights as an accountability mechanism. And I know that in some of your um, contributions there, you sort of asked about the role of the legislator here in the North and whether or not there would be sort of duplication or whether a bill of rights would be doing work that we as legislators should be doing. And I know Father Bartlett um, commented on that particularly. And I suppose for myself, we had had a, an informal meeting with the Oireachtas Committee and the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement on Friday past. And one of the Shanadori, Niall Blaney, um, made a comment around delivery of rights as he's a, a Donegal uh, representative and he was talking about the delivery of rights and how politics had delivered rights for him in his constituency and how that was a positive thing and they didn't need a bill of rights to deliver progress and I was struck instantly by two things number one I mean I have a lot of family in Donegal I know that Donegal is the forgotten poor cousin when you, when you look at the 26 county state and isn't thought about by Dublin or by central government and that has been the case for a long long time but then also examples of rights that haven't been delivered in the north because of political sort of objection to or a lack of prioritization and the big one we had a question from another rep around an Irish language act and that's it's the most obvious one when you're talking about these things and um, that that comes to mind so obviously after the creation of the state in the 26 counties, there was a very deliberate um, sort of a, a view taken and a deliberate policy made to try and reintroduce the Irish language to a lot of, of that state where it had been removed. And obviously you had your guilt act areas that survived all of that. But you can see that the language is, is starting to seep back in and obviously through the school system and all the rest of it. But in the north, because of people's objections, we still have a penal law which prevents the use of Irish language in court stating from, what is it, 1737. So to me, a Bill of Rights is there as your your stop mechanism to that and means that politicians from whatever background who are opposed to whatever right don't have that hiding place and a Bill of Rights sort of makes them or compels them to take action that they might otherwise not take. Um, so I... I would like to hear your thoughts on that. And um, I don't know if that answers the question around the role of a Bill of Rights as opposed to the legislator. But, uh, just, sorry, just, I think it's important to correct a point that you made there. The 1737 law that you referred to does not ban the use of Irish. It bans the use of any language other than English. And it was primarily directed at French. So I think it's important that, that we present our questions in an accurate way because that's important in order that people should understand that was not an anti-Irish language measure. 
it was to basically bring conformity um, to legal proceedings. I think that's important. Just to put that on the record. I'm sorry to uh, interrupt you, Tim. Christopher, with all due respect, it has the effect today of banning the use of Irish in a court, and this is Ireland. So take your point, but completely irrelevant. No, it's not. It's totally relevant, and it, it was reflective of a misrepresentation of historic the, the, facts. Christopher, the uh, presenters are now answering our questions. You'll have your opportunity. Indicate, and you can make a point. Chairman, if you're happy, I'll bring different members of our panel in. I'm going to give that one to Tim, first of all, but maybe two of us will answer it, uh, particularly about the Irish language issue. Tim? Sure. Well, just to say that uh, in that 2006 uh, forum, I was part of the subgroup on cultural and language rights. And again, I think we made incredible progress, but I'm afraid, frankly, the exchange we've just had uh, makes the point for me that there is a difficulty here. How are you going to try to resolve something in a Bill of Rights that, frankly, the Assembly hasn't been able to resolve itself? Uh, now, and whatever your personal opinion would be, it might be, for me, that's a matter of deep regret that the Assembly hasn't been able to resolve this, what shouldn't be a particularly controversial issue, in my opinion, about Irish language or other language rights. But I'm just making the point that uh, where the previous forum fell foul, was that it tried to resolve a lot of issues rather than capitalizing on the progress uh, and agreement that could be achieved on all of these issues. And it was considerable. And then trying to build something around that. And this interaction between the legislature and the Bill of Rights and society um, uh, is critical. And civic society, as you're involving in this process, is absolutely critical in what should be seen as an organic Bill of Rights rather than necessarily a static thing. So I think our exchange has actually typified the issue. Uh, if the legislature can't resolve these issues, why try to resolve them through a Bill of Rights? Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't do something important and significant in a Bill of Rights and maybe involve civic society, particularly in that process of resolving it. And sure, if I could just add to that uh, and echo, uh, you know, the principles that Tim's out outlined there. Uh, my colleague, my predecessor, Dr. Sam Hodgson, was with Tim through all those long months and years of the previous attempt to get a Bill of Rights. And Tim used a phrase earlier that perhaps overreach led to, to nothing actually being achieved. Although the discussion moved, I think, society on. Uh, there are things, as David has illustrated, really the victims and survivors, there are many other things that are, that, that are unique, in a sense, to Northern Ireland, that we need additional aspects in a Bill of Rights. And we would strongly advocate that, that that's what should be there rather than overreach. With regard to the Irish language, let me say this is a, a, a Presbyterian who, uh, in, in the tradition I come from, uh, have been very pro-Irish language in the past. Uh, some of our own people have forgotten that today, uh, that we would want to see uh, the Irish language valued and esteemed and rights be there. We probably would feel, as Tim perhaps has indicated, that that needs to be in legislation rather than, than, than a Bill of Rights because there are details. There are already protections there in legislation uh, for the Irish language, for, for other languages. But if we can't agree as politicians on what a, a, a bill needs to look like, a, a cultural bill or whatever it's called, to deliver whatever rights are missing, it's going to be very hard uh, in a Bill of Rights to deliver some of that detail. And the danger is in a Bill of Rights, it will simply become something that is fought out in the courts. So we wouldn't want to see overreach, but we do feel there is a need for a Northern Ireland-specific Bill of Rights as advocated in the Good Friday Agreement. Thank you to you both. And I suppose what Father Bartlett said around there about if, if something can't be sorted out, you had said if something can't be sorted out through the legislature, why would you try to sort it out through a Bill of Rights? And I'm paraphrasing you there, but I suppose for me that is the, 
that's the key. We can't get these rights delivered through the legislature because of political opposition. So this is an opportunity to deliver those rights elsewhere. And I, I don't know if you had cited up the CAGA document that they had produced around the, the number of things, particularly in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, that might not have happened had we had a Bill of Rights implemented here um, to act as that sort of check and balance. Um, and for you know, for me, for me, that's key. But I, I take on, on board um, what you're saying and obviously um, well, Reverend Gordon's remarks as someone who did our dissertation on Douglas Hyde. I, I appreciate the the uh, involvement there down through the, the generations. So, um, Sure. Sorry. Sir, if I may just on that point, uh, the point I'm making, though, is this, the Bill of Rights will require political agreement in the Assembly. You know, that's the reality. It's, it doesn't exist outside of that. Um, so how are you going to achieve a resolution in the Bill of Rights if you're not, going to, if you're not able to achieve it already politically now? That's just a, a hard fact. And so what, what I think my colleagues now are saying is, well, even if it's not fully achievable or, uh, in a Bill of Rights, there is still a lot could be achieved. And maybe civic society can assist in that process. But that, this is where it became unstuck previously. Um, no, I appreciate what you're saying. I suppose that, and for me, again, a regrettable fact that the recommendations from 2008 that the British government had sort of responsibility to implement, they allowed consensus to take sort of um, precedence over equality, which for, for me is, is a regrettable fact. But I'm going to bring um, Mike in next, and then I know Carl has indicated, and if anyone else is looking in, jump ahead. Chair, I don't think we quite caught what you said there at, at the end that you were inviting yeah. Karen, didn't you say? Mike and then Carl has indicated this. Hi, Mike, can you... I think you're on mute, Mike. We can't hear you. Nope. Technology can come and show us all up. Can hear you now. Right, yeah. I have a dodgy lead on this. That's it. Um, for, first of all, to, to get to David's point about victims and survivors, um, I spent some time, as I think most of you know, as, as a commissioner for victims and survivors. Uh, and while I think it would be wrong to look on them as an homogenous group, I think a great many of them had a common experience, which was when they became a victims and survivor, they had a reasonable expectation that the state and the agencies of the state of the state would form the wagons in a circle so that you know if they needed their children taken to school that would be done if they needed grocery shopping done it would be done if they needed some cash that would be provided and the experience was quite the opposite so i take david's point that as we look at victims of any sort of abuse or crime going forward um, that is something that we could look at uh, as a definite set of rights to be enshrined in a bill if I can be a bit um, provocative, I'm wondering if a Bill of Rights gives you a fear that this would impact on some of the practices and policies of any of your churches. And let, let, okay, let me give you two examples. Tim cannot marry because he's a priest in the Catholic Church. And, and Trevor, your church, I think in 2018, uh, introduced a new policy that said if you are in a gay relationship, you cannot be a full member of the church. And children of that relationship cannot be baptized. What, what if that became illegal because of the rights we put in for the protection of the LGBTQ plus community? Uh, thank you, Mike. I'm sure you're going to say thank you for that question, aren't you? Yes, thank you. For that question. Uh, I'll answer first of all, and then Tim can come in and tell us about his prospects for marriage. Uh, <laughs> with regard to the, the balances of rights, I, I, as you know, one of those protected rights in international and European uh, treaties and legislation is the right uh, to freedom of religion. And there is that right in there for a church to set its own 
doctrinal basis. Uh, there is not a right for the church to impose upon the state what the state legislates for in what has been called sometimes, for instance, civil marriage, etc. Now, churches have the right to say, as citizens and as people in the state, we do not feel certain things should be in legislation, but the church has no right to block that. However, uh, churches do have rights under international human rights law uh, to set their own doctrinal standards and the outworkings of that for their own membership. Now, I would assume that any Northern Ireland Bill of Rights is not going to swipe, swipe, sweep away internationally accepted and recognised standards in human rights. So I think we've nothing to fear from human rights. All rights, however, balance each other. My rights to certain things and your rights to certain things, Mike, have to balance each other. And that's why it's a, a complex issue. With that also goes responsibilities. And uh, you've gone straight for, for that issue in PCI. We have a responsibility if we have a particular doctrinal position to also work incredibly hard to, to demonstrate that we are not rejecting people, though it appears to some we are, but we are taking a doctrinal position. So we have a responsibility to do that, and we haven't been that good at that, and we need to do that in a much better way. So international rights will give religious protection to religious freedom, and we assume whatever is in the Northern Ireland Bill of Rights will not be sweeping that away. Uh, with regard to Tim's marital status <laughs> for the future, uh, we're all really interested in how he's going to answer that. <laughs> well, let me just say that, Mike, if you were to ask my nieces, they would say the question is not, should I be allowed to marry, but would anybody marry me? And uh, I'm afraid they're not very optimistic about that prospect for some reason. But I'm, I'm always open to offers. I'm always open to offers. Um, look, you raise a very important point, And I think Trevor has already set out a position that the Catholic Church would share. I think one of the difficulties in this whole issue of the uh, of rights in society, uh, in, uh, particularly when you go to legislate and, and try to build, for example, is this. I mean, is it what what are the values that are informing the rights themselves? And what you're right in to point to a real fear that faith communities collectively, and I include in that Muslims, Hindus, Jewish communities, and so on, do fear about the language of rights as it has developed in our society, is that it is a very individualistic understanding of human rights that is developed uh, in Western Europe in particular. And that's not consistent with the original anthropology of human rights, um, which was, as Karen and uh, particularly uh, reminded us earlier, was from the Christian anthropology of Europe where the whole concept of rights developed and human rights developed, was actually about a relational type of sense where responsibility, co-responsibility, my responsibility to you and to our common enterprise is as important as my right <clears throat> to expect from the state and from you certain things. So I th one of the fears we have is that there's a, a uniquely secular approach to the concept of, a, of, of human rights and that it is being used as a kind of a Trojan horse to sell a myth, and I'm going, to, I'm going to be provocative, to sell a myth that there is some kind of neutral philosophy in human affairs. And I'm going to challenge you as legislators now about your words, which I support, about creating a genuinely diverse uh, and shared society in every sense of that word diverse. And one of the great things since the Good Friday Agreement that we enjoy in Northern Ireland is increasing diversity of ethnic, religious, national, and other backgrounds and influences in our society. But um, there is no neutral philosophy, no neutral set of values. And the touchstone that has protected true diversity throughout our history is this fundamental human right to respect for conscience and freedom of religion. And therefore, there has to be, and this is a negotiation, this is part of the democratic process, this is part of the dialogue, and we as faith groups have to try and explain uh, and claim our space in this, what has to be uh, respecting the right of somebody to be different. 
and that there's not some new orthodoxy around that unless you believe this or that, even if it's a majority view, that you must relinquish your right to have a different view. And there is a fear that in some of these touchstone issues, that there's not a genuine space for diversity and respect, but that there is an effort to force not just religious groups on certain key, well-known key button issues, but in other groups and other ways to force everybody into a common set of values. When in fact, true diversity is that we might actually have different values, but they're not inconsistent with common the common good. They're not inconsistent with human dignity and they're authentically, rationally and reasonably held. Uh, so I think you've touched on something but it's part of the tension of a Bill of Rights, just like there might be a tension about language for certain groups. Then for religious groups, there is this tension between rights and responsibilities, as Trevor says, on some keystone issues. But there has to be the space for people to define themselves and choose to be who they want to be according to the lights of their conscience. I totally agree with you, Tim. And I, I used to say, you know, it's not about creating a society where we all basically jump into a virtual blender and come yeah. out human form of beige. But and that is, a, that is a fear. And one of the things that protects that is the right to respect for conscience and freedom of religion and philosophical view, I would go further to say, you know. Yeah. I mean, I was being a, a little provocative, but also looking back two weeks to the, the debate on banning uh, conversion therapy and the concern that, that this was in some way going to impact uh, on religion, on, on worship, on preaching, and certainly from my point of view, absolutely not. Totally, totally separate issues. But we always, I think, as, as legislators have to be aware of unexpected consequences, unintended consequences. Correct. And if I could be very positive and affirming to all of you as politicians for a moment, um, and I think you will find church people who are also in the public spotlight have great sympathy for your role and all that it involves uh, and respect and support for it. But um, I think you have actually set a great standard here uh, in this jurisdiction in terms, and today's a case in point, in terms of genuinely engaging with a wide range of civic and interested and related groups on most legislation that you're developing. And to take the gay conversion therapy issue, you know, that is something we have to get involved with you and others in in a discussion about and that's that's how you resolve it you know and the, 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 uh, mike, sorry mike the, what what you said there uh, about unforeseen consequences uh, and that was on one particular non-binding resolution in a debate in the northern Ireland assembly you know when you come to the issue of a bill of rights the issue of unforeseen consequences is exactly what some people fear. Uh, because, you know, I don't want to talk all day about conversion therapy. Uh, all the churches represented here want conversion therapy in its course of form banned. Let me say that on the record. But those who would be supportive of the resolution, both inside and outside the assembly, some wanted to go further than others, and I, we listened very carefully to your speech and Doug's speech and other speeches that talked very clearly about protecting religious freedom uh, and not wanting to ban certain things. But some who want that legislation in do want to go further, and some who will be generally supportive of a Bill of Rights and perhaps of making that Bill of Rights incredibly comprehensive for Northern Ireland will want to go a lot further in the use of that Bill of Rights than perhaps anyone in this ad hoc committee will want to go. And the danger is the unforeseen consequence and that we end up, rather than in a better relational society, we end up in a more litigious society, which is really the road to nowhere. I think it's an argument for thinking it through rather than stepping away, though, Trevor. And, yeah. and on your point about international instruments, I think the idea is, is not that you ignore them or try to override them. It's that you actually embed them uh, so that they are judiciable rights within Northern Ireland. Um, so thank you. Thank you both for your answers. And, and I'm going to hand back to the chair, sad in the knowledge I will now never know 
if I would have been invited to Tim Stack Night. <laughs> I noticed nobody nobody challenged the view of my nieces there that it was really about would I would anybody marry me? But anyway, I live with that. Oh no, um, that's a different debate altogether. Uh, <laughs> Carol, are you looking in? Hi, so uh, Grammy, I'll get Carly. Thank you, Emma, and thank you all for your presentations and all the commentary. Um, I suppose just a couple of assurances um, and just a couple of points. But first of all, um, people should have the right to practice their religion or practice whatever faith they want without fear or fear. I mean, that's, that's fundamental as far as I'm concerned. And equally, people also have the right not to have any faith at all. That's, that's up to them. But the reason why things are so litigious is because there has been a complete opposition and a denial of certain rights. And um, I mean, the Irish language is one, but I but I never know if people have been denied homes on the basis of their religion. And and, and that it should be need, not create, really. Absolutely. So and I know that's something we all agree on. Um but the other the other issue for, for us is that and I think um Father Bartlett you hit the nail on the head as to Trevor. Um so some of us are old enough to remember what happened during the Bill of Rights Forum and there was opposition and there's still opposition. So I I don't know how we're gonna get this resolved at all. But if we also attend something that's so bland and so benign, then we will be doing a disservice to all those groups who not only lobbied us to implement what was on a Good Friday Agreement, but if you look at the environment or you look at the LGBTQI, which wasn't in the Good Friday Agreement, which has since emerged, um, you know, these are people who are really paying on us getting this across the line. So it is very difficult. Um, but just to say that um, I just, I, I'm just off a, a background or from a background where I just believe rights are for everyone and shouldn't threaten anyone. Um, and the idea of just asking in a circle of, you know, judicial reviews or litigious processes is quite depressing. But equally, we do have to get something across the line because, you know, before, um, I've got a can't remember her name from the evangelical land. That Daniel. Um, Danielle was Danielle was talking about Donna's child's rights or disability. We've got actually very strong disability rights. Yeah. The problem is it's the implementation of those rights is where you get political blockages. And that's an issue, and that's been an issue for at least 23 years or more. So the idea of a Bill of Rights would actually set out a standard and the protections for what's there, but also the protections that aren't there yet. But I do accept your point that it needs to be organic and flexible, the odd and review, um, because we're not all the same. Um, and... The only thing, and it's more a commentary than, than questioning, um, the only thing I would ask is that, um, that you bear with us and, and try and convince, have to be convincers um, uh, in terms of getting those rights realised for people because it just, it's embarrassing that we're still talking about denial of rights. It's embarrassing that we're still, you know, jump on the top of a point over an Irish language act that was agreed many years ago. Um, I mean, public, like a language wouldn't threaten anyone. And it's also disappointing for all the young people and all the groups who came before us and their many who are basically asking us to get our acts together. So, um, but at the same time, I can't just do something small and then have to build upon it because we're here 23 years later. Um, and we're still talking about the rights that we hope to be realised as we hope to good Friday agreement. So I just I want to thank you for your presentations. Um, um, is there, um, 
I suppose reflective of our own selves on this panel. We're all from different backgrounds, but it would appear that Jews have got um, certainly a bit more synergy and compassion at times than what we have in the political system. So thank you. Thanks, Carl. I don't know if anyone wants to respond to any of those points. I know that Paula has indicated next. Uh, ju ju just to say, and for the, for the record, to say that in the presentations and the input of, of all the churches and faith communities to the last process, and again, some of the written material we've sent into this process, the, the whole issue of social and economic rights has been to the fore of what churches would want to highlight. Uh, you know, and that was intensified during the pandemic. Uh, all of us as elected representatives as church people, uh, we don't just sit in offices, we're on the ground in our parishes, our congregations, our constituencies. And no matter what the right was, it was always the poorest, the most vulnerable in society that suffered when anything goes wrong. And when the pandemic came, it was the poorest and most vulnerable who suffered the most. Uh, and rights, and that, that, that's part of the problem, and it's part of where the churches would agree with you, that there needs to be a legislative edge to this. And that's why we would sometimes think that some of these things would be dealt with in specific legislation rather than a, a general bill of rights. Because those rights of those most vulnerable people must be protected. And society has a responsibility to speak up for the vulnerable, but also to ensure that those key rights are to the fore when we think of a Bill of Rights. Uh, we, we have witnessed, we witness in our, our, our congregation, we witness in our parish, we witness in the communities in which we work, the, the fact that no matter what we say, for instance, about the rights for children who have uh, learning difficulties, who have social or educational disadvantage, the middle class parent will be able to push and use influence to get their rights delivered, mm -hmm. but the others won't. Mm -hmm. uh, and whatever we think of academic selection, those who are coached will do well. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an economic injustice and a social injustice. Now, I don't mean to debate academic selection with you. We can do that in another day. But those implications for us are very to the fore. And I wouldn't want to get us lost on, you know, same-sex marriage and all those usual touchstone yeah. issues. Yeah. Sometimes that's lost because mm -hmm. that, that focus on social and economic rights. You know, the, the basic teaching that all of us coming to today would base our philosophy on the teaching of, of Jesus Christ. And when you apply some of that in social and economic policy, I, as a Protestant, have a lot to learn from the teaching of the Catholic Church and its social theology, that we must be standing up for the vulnerable in society. So we, we want you to hear that very clearly in the things with Carl. I, I do, um, Trevor, and I, I really appreciate what you've said because I believe social and economic rights are really at the heart of this. And... You know, despite the fact that we fought really hard to get mitigations against welfare reform and Tory austerity, which we're still waiting on getting agreed, by the way. But there's nothing more sobering than going delivering food parcels to people through the pandemic and actually starting outside someone's yard, talking to them through a kitchen window. So there's, there is poverty. It's getting worse. There's also poverty of uh, aspiration as well. You know, it, it, this pandemic has also you know, had a, an impact on people who have been through a lot for many decades. And then even to this morning at the Health Committee, we're actually hearing that, so I live and represent North Belfast, so I live in a new lodge. And a man who lives in a new lodge is going to die seven years earlier than a man who lives a half a mile up the road. Not the same in East Belfast, South Belfast and West Belfast. And for the life of me, I just can't accept that inevitability. Well, the Bill of Rights came, but no, it won't. But if we have social and economic rights in the middle of it, and if we are true 
about looking after those who need us most, regardless should you be a follower of Jesus Christ or not. Then they're, for me, the fundamental tenets of looking after each other. Uh, and that's why it's really important. I would really you know, emphasize it's so important to make sure that that is included because if it's not, those figures are going to get deeper. The hurt is going to get deeper and people are going to die more, which is all preventable. So that's, I completely agree with what you said. Thank you, Chair. That's me done. Thank you. Paula, I think you had indicated next. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Pamela. Apologies. I, I, I had to about for half an hour there to meet with an Irish, Irish language group as our party leader. As Carl said, like 23 years they're waiting on their legislation, so um, it's, things are so slow in this country. Um, so I miss your presentation, but thank you for, for the written submissions. Um, I suppose, just to pick up on a few points that I, um, I heard when I joined, I, I heard Tim Bartlett there, and I, I first met you, as you recall, in the Bill Rights Forum all those years ago. You talk about human dignity, and and I suppose the, the, uh, Trevor mentioned there around you know an incredibly comprehensive Bill of Rights. And if I sort of marry those together in terms of what we can do going forward, first of all, I agree that the Bill of Rights will not be that comprehensive. What we need to do is to make sure that legislation supports it, whether that's um, strength and disability, equality, or otherwise. But um, and again, I recognise the the need to protect freedom of religion. But what, what I want to say in the Bill of Rights is, is a very strong um, pre-legislative scrutiny tool, which ensures that we are protecting all those human rights. And I'm thinking, for example, um, a bill that Claire Bailey is coming and bringing forward to the National Round Exclusion Zones around abortion clinics. And again, a pick up on the, the, the term there, human dignity, and the right for women to access health care without feeling harassed in so doing. But I do understand why people will present at that location because they, they believe that they're um, spreading the gospel and, and um, providing God's and uh, Christ's love. So I suppose there are some tensions there, but at the end of the day, if, if my focus is on health, jobs, um, poverty and housing, and then we will support um, you know, village people to practice their religion, but at the end of the day, we have to make sure that people can access healthcare services, for example, with human dignity. So just wanted to would respond to that. A, uh, I'm happy maybe if, if, if Danielle is back, she might want to answer that, maybe finish off what she was saying. Uh, yes. She's back. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do apologise for earlier. It literally popped out. I don't have a clue why. It just did. Um, but uh, I don't even know how far I got. I don't know what you heard before I realised that I wasn't on. But um, I was actually heading down the direction of uh, talking about abortion. And I take on what Paula had just shared with us there about the, um, the tension the tensions that there are, um, and just to speak about the abortion clinics and people standing outside, I don't think that is representative of all Christians in Northern Ireland. I don't think that that particularly shows the love of Jesus for someone standing outside telling someone that they're wrong. Um, and I don't think that, I mean, personally, that would not be my approach. I believe that Jesus was compassionate and Jesus was um always give you dignity to people and so although we may not agree with the actions that they're taking i don't think you could say that that would be all christians in northern ireland would be standing out and um, shouting or whatever they're doing um but i did want to get to the point um which has actually already been touched on already today and i don't want to overdo it but um this conflict this conflict of um, rights between the different groups. And I don't know what you heard, but I was talking about, I was talking about my colleague, Donna, and I was talking about her son who has disabilities, um, autism. And I was talking about how we celebrate. Um, we celebrate disabled people. In our society today, you know, we celebrate that there's accessibility and inclusion and opportunity. Um, and that's part, in fact, with the legislation that champions equality and bans discrimination. Um, However, how can we celebrate and champion disabled people and their rights on one hand, 
On the other hand, for cutting SEN systems, for legislating for abortions up to full term for any fetal abnormality, including Down syndrome. And then we even see in other nations that disability is acceptable as grounds for the ending uh, of life early. So Donna has been asked on more than one occasion, uh, so you don't believe in abortion then? As if that should have been the obvious choice for her. As if, um, if they had known about her son's diagnosis, that his ability or his disability was the main. So, in terms of um, rights, a right perspective, how do these two stories sit side by side? There's obviously a clear issue of competing rights. The rights of disabled people to live a full, well, financial life, and the rights of a mother to abort at any stage of gestation for reasons of disability or abnormality of her unborn baby. And I suppose that's just one example of competing rights, um, and there are so many more. Um, and so I think I do have issue with that statement that says extending rights to any one individual or group does not mean the lack of rights extending to anyone else. Um, because there will always be that barrier. Danielle, sorry, I'm not sure if someone else isn't muted or if. Yeah, it's a yeah. funny interference. Hi. Yeah, I can hear that too. Gone now, we can hear you now. Well, wait, apologies. <laughs> uh, uh, um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. You can, sorry. There is a lot of interference coming in. I don't know what's going on with my internet connection today or with this uh, app or whatever. I think my face is 20 shades of red rather than grey. Um, so one final point that I wanted to make, I, I won't try and get back into that line of conversation, but um, perhaps uh, in Northern Ireland, as in most democratic systems, we have an unspoken, perhaps even an unintended hierarchy of groups and their rights. It often appears that the groups that shout the loudest or most consistently for their rights are the groups that see most response to their calls for rights, such as the LGBT community, which is a minority, but who have recently seen their rights develop so fast. Whereas when we look at the rights of those with little or no voice, such as the homeless or the unborn, their rights do seem to be moving slower. But I think we've touched on that so much today, and I think that Tim Bartlett really um, explained it very well. Chair, if I, if I, uh, so moving beyond the, the specifics of that issue, but I think to go back to Mike Nesbitt's earlier point, you know, that we, how we resolve clashes of rights is a critical question for you and your journey about this issue of a Bill of Rights, you know. But what I would say on the back of, of uh, Paula and Carol is that I'd be very interested to hear what our legislators think about the concept of responsibilities somehow being incorporated into the philosophy, the language of such a bill. And I, I give you an example, uh, Carol, for example, you know, that uh, to put into a Bill of Rights the responsibility that each of us has as citizens or legislators have towards citizens. Uh, our instruments of the state have towards citizens and vice versa, that you will be heard and you will be heard with respect, with an open mind. You know, that, that's a, that changes a critical thing, the culture, <laughs> the culture of rights and responsibilities and how we as a society relationally, going back to Karen's comments about how I think the big plague of, of any conversation about rights these days for the whole of society is that we're still in this very individualistic what I, you, what you owe me kind of concept and philosophy or approach. And that still remains important in it, but modern and developing language about rights and bills of rights also brings in this sense of we are part of a society, we are relational beings, we have a commitment and a responsibility to the common good of each other and what are the values that help us and i think carol for example that can change the atmosphere of the conversation about things like language rights cultural rights and so on you know or even how we deal with clashes of rights uh, in the environment so i'd just be curious whether any of the legislators and paul i may say this if i may the years have been much kinder to you since the Bill of Rights Forum than they have to me. 
but uh, I think, would you agree, Paula, that there was good and interesting progress made, but I think, as Trevor said, there was probably overreach kind of just got us in the end. And that yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And thank you, Danielle, for your contribution as well. Um, I suppose that, again, the pre-legislative scrutiny tool, that, that would require us then to look at the broad range of rights. But, you know, in our calls, calls, of, calls for evidence at um, scrutiny stage on um, the committees, we would be calling people from different um, backgrounds or persuasions or experience to come forward anyway. So that is our responsibility to hear from as many people as possible. Um, but I, I suppose... Um, the other aspect of it is about how we um, are quite aspirational in, in our um, in the Bill of Rights going forward, and that is really about trying to identify some of the issues that Danielle's mentioned there around the, the people who maybe have a, a, a less voice and less profile in society, to make sure that whenever we bring forward legislation, that that you know we can amend it to make sure that we do, as part of that journey of listening, um, as, as scrutinising that we actually incorporate and make sure that our legislation is as rounded and as supportive um, as possible. So I think, you know, I think we're all on the same page. It's just, I think we're maybe looking at it from, from a different perspective at the minute. And forgive me, but just to say in that regard, you see, I think one of the things is what, what is the, the format, the character, the genre of this bill? Is it justiciable rights only, or is it also, for want of a better phrase, philosophical and, uh, relational in terms of what it, it invites us to as a culture around rights, you know, and therefore I think some of the new language about responsibilities has something to offer, even though it may not be that justiciable. <laughs> well, again, we, we've been struggling a wee bit with the judiciability of it and the fact that so many people have come forward. And I would always be afraid, and to go back to Trevor's part, point there, that we aren't going to be able to reflect all of the issues that have been brought to us in the evidence sessions in this appeal might feel disappointed and that's why we would need to supplement it with with other primary legislation through through the assembly and again that phrase that we we remember from all those years ago um tim the progressive realization you know i would like to see that taken forward and it's not even so much about um equality but also equity and that's really going back to the previous conversation with carol there about you know how do we look at the people who are most deprived and how do we we bring you know bring them forward and and, and deliver for them so yeah, we've still a lot of deliberation to do, I would say, but I think say, we're all heading in the same direction. Okay, Paula, no other member has indicated, so I know that Michelle, Mark and Christopher are still on the call. If any, if you want to ask any questions or make any points, just jump in. I don't think any of the other members want to say anything um so at that point i'm going to thank you all for your presentation again and thanks for taking the time to to interact with us this afternoon and i will let you take your ease thank you chairman and we, we, we've learned the wisdom of tim's nieces if not <laughs> thank you for helping us to discover that what was that about a culture of mutual respect and <laughs> encouragement and oh well that's me away from an assault now, you know. <laughs> if it wasn't, if it wasn't for the fact that the Presbyterians prayed for my church here in St Mary's in Chapel Inn back in 1783, Trevor, I'd be around to see you. Really well. <laughs> we're, we're looking at back with interest, but that's another day. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you all very much, and keep thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your work. Thank you. Good luck bye with bye. Your work. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Okay, members, as our clerics jump off there, we have the next item on our agenda this afternoon, which is chair's business, and we don't have any chair's business. Then you'll find the draft minutes, agenda item number six, at page 46 of your pack. So if members are content with the minutes, I don't see any dissent. Brilliant. Um, number seven, matters arising. If anyone has any matters arising. Nope. Perfect. And so then you'll see correspondence beginning at page 54 of your pack and we've just got two items there of note um a letter from lord reed thanking us for our informal engagement and then a, a submission from paul o'neill so members are again content to note and then we can go to our forward book program if people are content to note yep any other business 
Nope, brilliant. So the date, time and place of the next meeting, it'll be uh, the same time, same place next week. We also have an informal session with the Supreme Court judges of the 26 counties of Ireland at half four this afternoon. That's an informal session. I want to remind members of that. And also before we... Um, leave the meeting. Could members just stay on here as we close? We go into informal session just to arrange our um, meetings going forward and bringing them into real life and maybe a hybrid version. So if everyone is content. Yeah, yes. um, I, I just I give me apologies now. I need to leave to go to another meeting. So yeah, um, Michael, of course. Stay safe, everybody. Take care. No bother. Slan. Okay. Um, the clerk has left us so I don't know can we be brought out of public session please the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29 this is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29